imaging techniques have evolved, now we can look at the brain. So this is really important. At our centers, attention learning centers that we have in Irvine, San Juan Capistrano, and Encinitas, we do not treat anyone with nerve feedback or even medication until we know what's going on in their brain. And the boy on the doctor show was misdiagnosed twice before we saw what was going on in his brain. This is a common referral from a principal. I usually get these at the beginning of the year, but sometimes they get these anytime. This is a boy who's been in the principal's office every other week the whole year. The principal keeps telling him, he says, listen, Johnny, think about what you do before you do it. Can you read what Johnny says? By the time I think about it, I've already done it. Johnny's impulsive, so what do we do? I tell the principal, let's get him tested because if he really has ADHD or Asperger's, it's not all his fault. He may not be able to control what his brain can't do. If he doesn't, then we probably have to have a behavior contract or we have to be pretty strict with home and we have to work on parenting techniques. We often have to do both. That's why we do the testing. Now when I talk about testing or we use the word assessment, there's usually three steps that we recommend. The first step is an interview where how we do it is I, I meet with all the clients myself and I meet with the students and I meet with the parents. I like to ask the kids questions. A lot of doctors ask questions and the parents answer, so I try to let the parents let me kind of talk to the kids. I ask them, one of the questions I ask them right away, I said, well, you know, what did mom and dad tell you about coming in? Nothing. I said, what? Nothing. They didn't tell me anything. Well, you mean you drove an hour all the way here and they didn't say anything about what you were doing? No. Did they think you were going to go to the beach? Are we going to the beach? No, no, no. Don't you remember I was telling you in the way in here what we were going to do and the doctor takes pictures of your brain that's going to try to help you out? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. The other thing I do when I go out in the waiting room, I kind of walk up to people and I um, kind of introduce myself and I go up to the kids and I say, hi, I'm Dr. Mike, and I shake their hand and I try to get good eye contact with them. And then when they come back in my office, I try to see if they can remember my name. And most of the kids with ADD can't, even though I think I got good eye contact. Now, some of the really bright kids will look at the diploma behind me and say, <laughs> Dr. Michael Linden, and, or they'll look at my business card. But most of the kids are forgetting why they're here. They're forgetting my name. I ask them about school. I like to ask them how hard they try in school. I ask them, especially because with ADD, what do you do when you get bored? <coughs> well, I daydream, or I think about sports, or I fi fix, I build things in my desk, my text message, just as some of the adolescents tell you now. Um, I ask them that. I like to ask all the kids about friends. I ask them, do they have friends at school? Do they have friends in the neighborhood? How many friends do they have? Is it enough friends? A child with Asperger's might say, yeah, I have, I have an, a lot of friends, enough friends, and they might have one friend, and that may actually be enough for them. Um, but I ask them if they get teased. Um, so that's, a, that's important, the social aspects. We ask about what subjects are hard for them. And then with the parents, we go over family history because these are all genetic. We go over developmental history. If someone's had a head injury, like I saw an adult yesterday who thinks he has ADD as a child and then he got in a car accident a couple years ago and now it's a lot worse. So now he has two different issues going on, kind of a head injury and ADD. So we go, question? The, the subjects that I see the students have a harder time in and get more bored with are math, social studies, especially history. They can't like think something that's abstract that they can't relate. A lot of the kids in the private schools who work with a lot of the kids in the uh, Catholic and Christian schools, religion is sometimes hard for them, especially rem like remembering Bible verses. Um, but it tends to be the more concrete ones, but sometimes it depends on the teacher too. Um, a lot of the boys with Asperger's really like science and math. They're very good at that. And then we do the rating scales for the parents and teachers that are adult. But the two tests I'm going to focus on are the continuous performance test, the attention test we do, the computerized, and the brain imaging test we do called the QEG map. The, the first test I'm going to talk about is called a continuous performance test. And the newest one that's out that's available is called the IVA. It stands for Intermediate Variables of Attention. And this is an auditory and visual test 
that measures how well you pay attention when you're bored out of your mind. And if any of you have taken this or heard about this, you know what it's like. This is the most boring computer test you could think about. You see and you hear different numbers, a one and a two for a child, and there can be up to five numbers for an adult. You practice this boring test for five minutes. When you see or hear the one, you push the mouse as fast as you can. When you see and hear the two, you ignore it. Sounds simple. They're written at like four or five-year-old levels, but it bores you out of your mind. You remember what I called ADD earlier, interest deficit disorder? So if you have ADD, this is like torture. You hate being bored. I mean, the kids are like, oh, I can't do this. This is too difficult. I remember a couple years ago, this boy told one of us, well, my mom said if something was too hard, I didn't have to do it. So he was a little oppositional on top of that. <laughs> but it's really boring. Now, our adolescents, I wish were that polite, but they're not. They're a little bit more rude and impulsive, and they swear, and they cuss. And a couple, years, a couple years ago, I had a couple that took the mouse and threw it and cracked it on the wall or against the monitor. So I kind of didn't want that to happen again. And I decided I was going to put double-sided Velcro on the bottom so they couldn't pick it up. But I found out you can't do that. You have to move it around. But we tell the adolescents, this is a boring test. If you get frustrated, keep the mouse on the table. <laughs> now, what about adults? Adults who take this test, we do these in the morning between 8 and usually 1.30. You can't be drinking a big thing of uh, Starbucks coffee. You can't be texting or on your Blackberry. can't be talking. What do you think an adult might do when they're taking this attention test and they're bored? And it just doesn't change the rhythm. It's flat. Just keeps it, it has no you, you've taken this. So what do you think an adult might do when they get <laughs> really, really bored? Stop doing it. And, and when they stop doing it, what would they do then? They often fall asleep. <laughs> they fall asleep when you can't talk and you can't stimulate yourself. So let me show you some patterns because even though this is a test with ADD, about eight years ago, we started doing research with autism and Asperger's <coughs> found that ADD and autism and Asperger's each generally have a different pattern on this test. So um, these are a little hard to 